Teardown time, dollar store timer. Believe it or not, lots of technology. Let's tear it apart. To reverse engineer the assembly, obviously you take it out of the case and you get a green circuit board. Under the circuit board is a black blob and under that black blob will be a bunch of technology on a integrated circuit. Let's uh, pop that off. Here's a slide, here's some adhesive and stuck to that adhesive is the semiconductor which controls the timer. Let's put this under a microscope and uh, sort down the engineering. Okay, well, here we go. This is the uh, silicon die that sits in that timer. Always pretty to look at. Uh, the golden bits are basically uh, the metal interconnections. And below the metal interconnections are all the semiconductors formed in what's known as a diffusion layer. That's the uh, pink and turquoise bits. Um, let's see, let's sort down what should we look for first. Probably the uh, clock oscillator. Uh, obviously, to have a timer, you're gonna need some sort of uh, repetitive clock signal. Uh, that almost certainly is down here on the die and uh, the circuitry sits between uh, two pads, uh, one here and uh, the other one here. Uh, to sort down what that is though, why don't we just take a quick reminder as to how it's constructed. There's gonna be a component on the outside of the silicon die. A uh, clock uh, is always created from a uh, crystal oscillator. Well, not always, but in this case, it has to be a crystal oscillator uh, because the crystal is a very precise uh, component. And uh, that crystal is almost always inserted into this topology here. So here's our crystal. And then uh, the star of the show is a inverting amplifier, which causes a 180 degree phase shift. And then there's two components which set the uh, set point. Uh, for this uh, gate here, you want sort of the midpoint. So it's always oscillating at a 50% duty cycle. Uh, that's created out of this resistor capacitor combination. It basically sets this voltage here uh, at the midpoint. And then the final uh, element is something called a load capacitor here, uh, often uh, omitted from the circuit board. Um, sometimes the parasitics of the package is sufficient, saves a bit of money. Uh, these two capacitors uh, are two large capacitors to be on the silicon. Uh, however, uh, this uh, inverter and that resistor uh, almost certainly are. Inverter, uh, just to remind what we're going to look for, uh, is always constructed out of uh, two FETs, uh, MOSFETs, NFETs, whatever you want to call them, uh, depending on the process. But uh, basically you'll get an N-channel MOS construction here and then a P here. That's it. There's just two transistors. That's what's so cool about uh, CMOS technology. Uh, very easy to construct. Okay. So here's a zoomed in view. Uh, I've taken some microscope photographs at a slightly higher resolution for anyone. It's just a partial. Uh, it's a little time consuming once you increase the magnification, but here's our two pads. And uh, on the bottom side here, uh, we can see two transistors. And this is the inverter right here. Now you got this long serpentine, which is a sure sign of a a field effect transistor. Uh, this is the gate and basically the source of the drain are on either sides of the gate. Current flows through it uh, if the voltage is correct on the gate. So that's the inverter. And, but of course then you think, well, okay, but there's obviously some stuff up here. Um, what's going on here? Uh, the other thing to note is that uh, this, because this is the output of the FET, this is probably the output here of the inverter. Up here is the uh, input and uh, so we see a couple structures here, look like diodes. Uh, they could be involved basically to um, provide uh, the prevention of a latch up. Uh, basically the diodes will clamp on the die so you don't get, uh, there's a parasitic uh, SCR that basically is formed by silicon. So you need to avoid that. And that leaves uh, what obviously is a fat. Um, now this is going to provide that resistor in one mode, uh, but I believe it's a FET, not just a resistor in this design, because it actually has another purpose, which we will discuss uh, when we get to that bit of the silicon. Okay, so uh, we now have a wonderful 32 kilohertz uh, signal coming out of this component here, uh, but we want to have a timer that counts at one second interval. So we need to scale that down uh, and that'll be uh, circuited here. And uh, we'll just zoom in here. And we're going to see a regular pattern and uh, just highlight one of the regular patterns. Like one here. Uh, this is a flip-flop and uh, there's actually seven flip-flops in a row. So it goes from 32 kilohertz down to about 256 hertz. 
Uh, not to one hertz, because uh, there's something above here uh, that needs to run a little bit faster, like as you press the button, uh, you want a little more interactiveness, so you don't want it running down one hertz. Um, you also don't want this circuitry above, though, running at 32 kilohertz, because that would consume a lot of electricity. Uh, when a flip-flop flops, it uh, costs uh, electricity. And this uh, device is powered by a tiny little coin cell that'll last a few years. So we basically have a prescaler down to a reasonable frequency coming out at this end here. And then that leaves uh, logic up here. And this essentially is the thinking bits of the timer. So as you press the button to increase the uh, hours and to increase the minutes, and then the button to start the timer and the button to clear the alarm, uh, and even the alarm itself. Um, is done as something called a digital state machine. This is not a microprocessor design. Uh, basically, uh, you have flops going along here, and there's a design technique uh, called a state machine design. Uh, you can Google that if you're not familiar with it. It's uh, a way of designing uh, digital state machines, and um, that's what's going on there. So uh, we've now sorted down. We have a 32 kilohertz clock. We have a prescaler here, and then we have the control up here. Uh, before we dive further in the die, though, let's take a look at that crystal, and uh, we'll uh, then be finished with the timing portion of this chip. Okay, so this metal can uh, has a crystal in it, and uh, let's take that uh, metal can off. A little bit of uh, tips here in terms of reverse engineering to get these cans off. Uh, a little bit tricky, they're quite small. I, I took a piece of wood here, I drilled a hole in it, and as you can see, I just uh, I mounted the, the poor little crystal upside down. Uh, it's glued in place, and that allows it easy to handle because the, the wood's much bigger. I, I took a file uh, around the can, uh, slowly scored it away, worked carefully around it, and uh, out pops the crystal, uh, sitting, of course, uh, here. And uh, i just go to another picture so we take a better view of what that crystal looks like. So, a uh, 32 kilohertz watch crystal uh, looks like a tuning fork. It's the sl uh, slowest frequency crystal I think uh, they make. Uh, but it's just like a, a tuning fork made out of metal which you would hit and it would vibrate. Uh, exact same structure, just quite frankly smaller. Uh, the lead comes up here and it goes onto one side of the silicon. The other lead on the other side goes up on a parallel structure here. You apply a voltage, it uh, forces the tines apart. Uh, that's the piezoelectricity parts of it. And then as the maximum voltage occurs here and the tines are forced apart their maximum, the stiffness of the silica, uh, the stiffness of the course will cause the tines to want to come backwards. And as they do so, they'll actually generate a voltage. And, uh, as long as you have an inverting amplifier on the leads of this uh, to keep it going at its resonance frequency, uh, off it goes. It, uh, it's very, very precise. Uh, these crystals can be produced uh, in mass quantities uh, by uh, industrial process. Uh, it's very inexpensive. Okay, what's next? Uh, there is an LCD display. So let's take a look at the signals that are driven into this display. And then we'll uh, sort down some of the silicon details. So the uh, silicon die drives out uh, appears to be 12 signals to this connector here. Then that connects to the LCD. Uh, on the extremes, they're both marked with the word common and common over here. And then we have uh, 10 signals here. Let's put this uh, assembly onto an oscilloscope and start probing the signals. Okay, so I have the uh, scope probe on what's marked as a ground pad for the LCD. And of course you can see it's not ground at all. It looks like an AC signal. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, LCDs don't like being driven with a DC voltage. If you don't provide them an AC bias, uh, they tend to misbehave. The other interesting thing we're going to find here is you can see this is zero volts here, but it goes up one and a half volts, which is the little uh, tiny battery that powers this. But the voltage also goes down, so we're going to find a circuit which uh, flips the voltage and inverts it. Uh, now, the LCD doesn't draw a lot of uh, power, so it's not going to be a very powerful power supply, but the fact that you create two voltages. Um, it's a repetitive pattern. Uh, basically, it just goes through probably all the segments. It's a 4-7 segments, uh, which is um, 21, uh, plus a colon for the count, and that's what's 22. And uh, let's uh, add a signal to this to sort down this a bit further. Okay, got a second signal and the counter is actually working. And you can see it's producing a pattern of one second because it counts down basically. 
And let me just stop this here and uh, we'll take a, a better understanding of it. So same thing, uh, the, the zero volts here, so it's going above and below. Uh, what you want to do, of course, you want to turn an LCD on, you want to turn a positive voltage, um, and you can see a, a series of patterns here. And of course, and the negative is basically when it's trying to drive the other direction. Uh, it's a multiplex display, we have about 20, 22 segments to uh, power on, but we only have about 10 data pins going to it. So what it does is that you drive uh, the foreground uh, pixels with one set of voltages going one way and you do the uh, background pixels driving it the other way. So this is what we're seeing here and the pattern repeats uh, again and again. Um, so as we take apart the integrated circuit we should be able to find this circuit and we should see some of the signatures about how it's designed. Okay, to create a negative voltage from a positive voltage uh, you need a circuit called a switch capacitor voltage converter. Uh, this is a data sheet for a standalone component from linear technology uh, but it demonstrates uh, this circuitry quite well. You need uh, a switch here and a switch here and here is a capacitor. And basically, you, you charge the capacitor up, and of course, it's positive in this voltage. And, and then you flip it around, basically. In the next cycle, you have another two sets of switches. So you open up these, and you close these. Uh, but if you look closely, you can see the capacitor gets inverted. So the what was the ground pin gets connected uh, here. And of course, the positive pin gets connected to ground. Uh, and that results, of course, in a negative voltage. So um, it's a very clever way of creating a negative voltage using just a capacitor and, and no inductor. Okay, let's find the switch capacitor voltage inverter. Uh, on the uh, left-hand side of the chip, you see some large flat areas. Uh, those are capacitors. Let's just zoom in. I, I suspect it's in this section here. We see the voltage converter uh, here uh, because we're seeing some switches and we're also seeing some capacitors. And they're probably an output filtering capacitor. So that's the negative voltage generator. And then uh, up here on the top of the die, these are all the pins that drive the LCD. And if we zoom in this section here, um, as of course you drive the signals out, they're trinary. They're a, a negative voltage ground or positive. And I suspect this series of transistors here are level shifters, which allow you to drive those uh, trinary voltages out to the LCD. Okay, one more component worthy of discussion. Uh, when the timer, of course, goes off, you need to be alerted, and that needs to be uh, created through a sound. This is a piezoelectric buzzer. Let's uh, take a look on the oscilloscope to see the signals being driven into this and sort down whether the uh, little semiconductor generates a signal uh, to this piezo or just supplies power and causes it to beep. Okay, let's go to the beeper, and every time I press the button, uh, it goes and beeps, of course. Um, and this is the signal that's coming out of it. Now, I'm actually on a, a 2 volts for division action. This is going up with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 volts, so that's interesting. And let's just uh, go into uh, a single shot mode here. Capture the pulse train, that's good. Then let's just um, change the base here. There we go, there's the pulse. Uh, it's coming up uh, 2, 4, 6, 8 volts. So we'll have to take a look at that circuit as well as to why the voltage is so high. Okay, just to track down why we're getting such a high voltage in the buzzer, I think it's just the field collapsing around the piezo element. Uh, they must have a good clamping diode on that uh, integrated circuit to survive such a bad shock. Um, or has very short service life, I suspect it might be the latter. Uh, but you can see the microprocessor produces the pulse. It's very small though. Uh, typical of something like an I.O. Uh, driving out. Uh, probably needs a pull-up actually to reach the full height, but sort of proof that indeed uh, it's not driving out the 12 volts. Well, there we go. Uh, even the most mundane looking item on the store shelf actually is just packed with technology. And with a little bit of knowledge of engineering, uh, you can quickly reverse engineer it and sort down how it was constructed. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and uh, we'll catch you in the next one.